Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, just got off a tutorial uh, and it's the first time I've ever taught a tutorial when there were people actually in Australia speaking, uh, sitting in on it as well as people in the US who, you know, kudos to them, had uh, gotten up at two in the morning to attend. So it, it's, uh, we're in, you know, for, for some pretty yeah, unprecedented times. Um, before I actually start, introduce myself and you know, hand over to Veronica, I wanted to go in and actually thank uh, Monica, Basha, Eva, and John, who have managed to pull together this conference out of thin air uh, by pretty much working around the clock. It's, uh, as we've said before, you know, this pandemic might be keep it, keeping us apart, but then it's not stopping us from being together. And I think, you know, as Mihao said, you're know, making the deadline of May 28th was especially important to us because that's when we should have all been in Stockholm. Uh, enjoying you know, the Scandinavian summer and you know, beautiful weather uh, whilst you're know, listening to great talks. At least you know, we can still be together, but doing it uh, virtually. So yeah, thank you so much you know, for having us. Um, so no, my name is Francesco. I'm uh, the founder and technical director of Airline Solutions. And I've had the privilege of you know, working with Airline for the last 25 years and you know, seeing it evolved you know, from a programming language, which is what it was when I first started using it, into an actual ecosystem. And I'm especially proud and happy. You know, it's often, not often you find like-minded people who, who actually share your views and opinions. And I'm really glad you know, to be speaking with Veronica today. Uh, Veronica, over to you. Yeah, hi, I, I'm Veronica Lopez. I am super, super excited to be here. Thank you for organizing this conference and keeping us together. Uh, so. Well, yeah, as my introduction says, I'm a software engineer at DigitalOcean, and I'm also currently a release manager associate for the Kubernetes organization. And you will see how that will be relevant for this talk in a little bit. And I'm super proud to be here with Francesco. So, you know, in brief, you know, as kind of the whole ecosystem around us has evolved, you know, hardware has become more powerful. And you know, trends and fashions have come and gone. You know, there've been tendencies uh, in the computer science world to go in and reinvent the wheel. Sometimes you know, they've done it well. Uh, sometimes they've done it badly, and you've know, gone in and added unnecessary complexity. And what this causes the industry to do is, you know, whenever we take two steps forward, it almost feels like you know we take a step back. You know, stopping us from advancing as fast as we should be uh, should be going. And I think you know, just to keep it in theme. I think you know, we'll be hearing very similar messages on how to avoid this problem, both from Brookings Lenk and uh, Robert and Boyd in their keynotes. So, you know, if we go back and look at Erlang's history, it's had an excellent track record at actually predicting the future. You know, so you know, we often say that it was designed for the internet age, even though it predates the web, and it was designed for multi-core computers, even though it predates them too. And you know, the intent, you know, when they set out to invent a language was to figure out how to develop the just ne next generation of you know, telecom systems, which, you know, at the time were the only systems predating the internet, which had to be scalable and fault tolerant. But, you know, ever since being invented, we see it influencing modern programming languages in, in many shapes and forms. And I think the secret source is the fact that it's got a no shared memory approach to concurrency that automatically you know, gives us distribution. Once you have solved the distribution problem, you automatically get scalability and reliability, as well as you know, scaling on multiple architectures. Now, if we backtrack about 20 years to my you know, time at the computer science laboratory, where I was an intern uh, with Joe, Mike, Robert, and Bjarne, um, Klacke, who I think should probably be in the audience today, uh, came about. You know, he's the one, for those of you who don't know him, who wrote Erling Distribution, he created Mnesia, he invented a bit syntax, wrote the first ASN compiler, and did m many more things. And he came by and he kind of gave me a copy of the Java white paper. And reading it, I went in and actually had a, a sense of deja vu. You know, it was a virtual machine, you know, concurrency model, you know, built in memory management and, and, and garbage collection. And, you know, it was, uh, you know, it felt like you know, we were all working with cutting edge technology, yet, you know, and usually the sign you get when, you, when, when you're kind of slightly ahead of the curve is that everyone's there calling you crazy. And, and they were calling us crazy for wanting to implement software real-time systems using a virtual machine. 
uh, everyone you know, we spoke to, you know, outside of Ericsson, believed that this extra layer you know, we were adding between our software and our um, and the hardware was too slow. And the only way you know, you could implement scalable programs was in C. You know, realizing and looking at it today, you know, I don't think anyone who was telling us that realized the true costs of of implementing and not using the right tool for the job. You know, thinking of loss of productivity gains, ease of development, and even, you know, the whole reduced maintenance cost. You know, uh, at the end of the day, you're running a program on, the, on a VM, you're actually reusing C code, and, you know, the C code which the VM itself was written in. So, you know, we usually joke that, uh, you know, tell managers that Erlang is, is actually a domain-specific language implemented in C, and, and they'll let you buy it. So, you know, at the time, you know, we, despite being called the crazy ones, there were three major projects within Ericsson. You know, they're packet-based switching sys solutions, they're broadband solutions, and they're mobile internet solutions. And it's no secret that, you know, kind of Erlang's at the forefront of Ericsson's 5G infrastructure today. And, you know, the lessons we learned from them at the time is that you don't have to be the fastest. You know, you have to be fast enough, you know. And, and that's really, I think, critical even, even, you know, when we start looking at the future. So when we look at it, you know, the JVM itself is a fine piece of engineering. Um, but at the same time, you know, looking back, you know, we realized it was also a product of a marketing department riding uh, the wave of the whole Microsoft antitrust wars you know, back in the 90s. And, you know, today you know, you'll find lots of talks, blog posts and articles, you know, comparing the JVM to the Veeam. Um, and I think back then, you know, there was one major difference which I didn't realize, and it took me quite a while to realize, and it's the whole idea of threads versus concurrency, of shared memory versus no shared memory, of mutable state versus immutable state. And you know, whilst you know, both the Beam and the JVM are amazing piece of engineering, you know, they were actually, if you look back, actually built to solve very different problems. The JVM is built for speed, and optimize for speed, you know, whilst the beam is built for scalability or rephrasing it, uh, you know, using a different set of words, the beam was built for concurrency and the JVM for, you know, parallelism. And, you know, what's the real power of concurrency? Once you have concurrency based on no shared state, you have distribution abstracting away from where, you know, things are executed. And you don't need to worry about threads, you know, crashing, you know, what's in the critical section or corrupting your state. You don't need to worry about location of your shared memory and issues with network connectivity. You know, what distribution does is it will slow down the computation through latency because you need to transfer the data, you need to transfer the requests from, you know, one location to another. But, you know, it might slow down a single computation, but if you're actually doing multiple computations and doing them in parallel, it will actually speed up the whole process, you know. And it's the same concept which, you know, will get your programs to scale on multiple architectures. And, you know, in those cases where you know, latency does matter, uh, we're seeing more and more of these issues in today modern day systems, locality and affinity, you know, become key. You know, this is where edge computing comes into the picture and fog computing uh, and the likes. You know, these are probably terms you know, you've all heard in some shape or form. Now, the future of programming, whether we like it or not, will be distributed. You know, just the fact that you've got a mobile app, you know, connecting to a serverless backend, uh, that's a distributed system. You know, all the serverless backend means is that someone else is managing your server, someone else is managing your infrastructure. It's still, you know, a distributed system. So, one of the very kind of first forays into distributed systems. Um, you know, back in the 90s, and also one of the very first open source products uh, Ericsson released was Eddyware, which was, you know, clusterware, which dynamically allowed you to scale up and scale down uh, web servers on existing hardware. It did not matter if the computers were running Solaris, Linux, or, you know, or Windows NT. Uh, the whole idea is that, you know, through a distributed file server and the predecessor of the Beam, so the Jam virtual machine, Joe's abstract machine, uh, which was running the web servers, when you know, staffing offices went home, the idea was to use the computing capacity of their desktop machines to run, um, run other services. So in other words, when Europe went home, uh, all, you know, all of the web servers you know, for the US would start running on everyone's desktop 
And this is orchestration and optimal kind of use of computing per capacity and almost seen as a predecessor to cloud computing. And you know, cloud computing itself came about 10 years later. And with it, you know, we also got uh, virtualization. So personally, you know, virtualization is kind of something which I think at least in the airline community, we never come to grips with. Uh, you know, it has a lot of use cases, but amongst its use cases, you know, scalability has never been one of them. Uh, the Beam itself is, is a virtual machine, which in itself is an operating system which handles all of the scheduling of your processes. The hypervisor, uh, which um, runs a virtualization, is in itself a simulator of an operating system, which in turn runs on an operating system. And I don't know why it's so hard to understand, but I've actually struggled to explain it to people that you know, the more layers you add between your software and your hardware, the slower your program is going to run and the more memory is going to use. And you know, it's always kind of felt weird uh, explaining this. You know, we've had cutting edge technology, which you know, will scale vertically as well as horizontally. You know, why add all of these layers and get everything you know, to run slower just to get the horizontal scalability? You know, I think you know, back in the days, you know, we were running, so back in the days, probably 2015, you know, we had uh, with the CTO and founder of Infobox in the US, a uh, proof of concept. You can look it up it's, uh, on GitHub, it's called Flow Forwarding, it was all open source, but it was the Ling virtual machine. Um, so running on Zen, running on Zen hypervisors, direct on their bare metal. It took milliseconds to spin up automatically, and you know, and it would automatically you know, set up and tear down network connections, uh, you know, based on software traffic analysis. So you know, you'd go in and orchestrate, you know, thousands of VMs which you'd spin up in a few seconds, and then network connectivity between these VMs would be set up and torn down based on you know based on traffic and, and based on needs, you know, allowing you to optimize both for bandwidth and for uh, latency. And, you know, this is not the future I'm describing, you know, I think you'll probably recognize a lot of this concept now when Veronica takes over and starts talking, but, you know, this was probably the first example of, you know, para-virtualized airline I've come across. And, you know, very much like in a modern container will allow you to run, you know, without hardware virtualization. Now, Back in 2015, I think, don't think the world was ready for this. Uh, you need a new mindset, you need new programming models, and you needed new types of challenges to solve, which you know, very few people, I think, when we described it, were able to understand. I mean, it was only 2012 where you know, WhatsApp went in and published a blog post that they'd achieved 2 million TCP IP connections. And, you know, and they did this by you know, making changes both to the Beam and FreeBSD. I think a lot of these changes, um, you know, three years later had made it into mainstream technology. And if you look at 2015, you know, Phoenix achieved, you know, 2 million TCP IP connections out of the box. And the only thing which stopped it to scaling further was in fact, uh, the network issues in, I believe, Amazon, uh, uh, the cloud provider, which they used at the time. But, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, 2 million TCP IP connections, but this is again, vertical scalability. You know, to achieve true scale, as we've always seen it, you need horizontal scalability. And, um, you know, and I always go back and think about flow forwarding when, when, you know, when I look at where we're heading today, because you know, that's really where, you know, the world is heading. Uh, you'd spin off containers, it will take a few milliseconds, you know, you spin off uh, Erlang or Zen instances, it will take you a few milliseconds, a bit like, you know, you spin up containers today, but you were doing it at a fraction of the cost with you know, much, much less overhead. So, you know, they were way, way ahead of their time. And, you know, you need a different programming model when you're dealing with these approaches and you need a different mindset. And I think, you know, the world at the time was not ready you know, to build that scale out of the box. So, you know, we go in and we fast forward a few years, uh, you know, another hype which we had to live through was that of, you know, containerization. And, and I have to say, it's still ongoing. And again, you know, the idea that you can orchestrate containers whilst uh, not wrong in itself is already you know, tightly coupled to the beam mindset of let it crash. But you know, the question I always ask me is, you know, did it take us a step back? You know, we've got Kubernetes and Kubernetes is a supervisor. 
Kubernetes will restart containers. Uh, we've got you know, Kubernetes, which will send messages to Docker instructing to start, pause, stop containers. And you know, you've seen it all before. You know, I know myself, I'm getting another sense of deja vu. You know, we already have an operating system of top operating system. You know, do we really need containers? Now, that said, you know, the real positive thing about Kubernetes and containers is that they're contributing to the whole movement you know, towards cloud native. And if you think back of it, you know, in the airline communities, you know, cloud native is how we've been doing things uh, by not being bound to a particular operating system back in the day or you know, a cloud provider today. Uh, as you know, one of the questions that I often ask myself is, you know, kind of could Erling or Alex here, you know, become part of this orchestration, which we're seeing today, enhancing and extending Kubernetes itself. And I mean, we know already that it's an excellent uh, tool, you know, for handling and manipulating state, especially a distributed state where, you know, we want to decentralize orchestration, you know, and indeed I'd say it's almost kind of the right tool, you know, for the job. So, I know, you know the, the, the title of this talk is where is the future, you know, is the future of programming? And you know, the question I always ask is, you know, where is the future taking us? Um, again, you know, that's a question I've been asking myself for 25 years. <laughs> but uh, you know, my view today is that with cloud native applications, you know, we want the developer to start abstracting away from the complexity of the orchestration, abstracting away from the underlying hardware and the network layers. You know, we want, again, to let the programmers, once again, just focus on the business logic. Making the belief, you know, they're coding an application for a single big machine, you know, following a particular model. And their code then, you know, thanks to underlying layers, will then become resilient and scale, you know, without them to, you know, to, to be able to actually go in and change a single line of code. And, you know, these were ideas and concepts, you know, we were working with, five years ago and even 20 years ago. And, you know, the question is, you know, why is it not really available today? Yeah, so that, this is the reason why I'm here today and why Francesco and I agree. And we have been agreeing about these topics for a long time and this finally happened. <laughs> and well, the, the main reason is uh, because since most of my current work happens uh, in the Go and cloud native ecosystem, uh, I can see a similar deja vu effect um, that the one that Francesco mentioned, but with uh, Go versus the Beam, or now more specifically with Kubernetes versus the Beam. Uh, and for purposes of this talk, uh, please try to use Kubernetes as almost any other available tool uh, right now in the cloud native ecosystem. Uh, so uh, currently, developers end up setting all their expectations on Kubernetes itself instead of giving that responsibility. Uh, either to the lower layers or the layers where it really makes sense to give this responsibility to. And as I mentioned in other talks, and Jose Valim has a great blog post about this, uh, when people ask me whether it makes sense to use Kubernetes or other uh, cloud native tools if you're using the Beam, uh, the answer comes down to, to this, like to the layers. Where is your problem at? And when, when are you not reinventing the wheel? And yeah, so uh, the, the, this book comes from a popular phrase that says something like, uh, every tool's a hammer if you want it to be, uh, which uh, means that any tool can become whatever you want. Uh, but in this case, we can use that creativity somewhere else, or at least that's my opinion, uh, because we have these amazing tools, but uh, if we end up using them for the wrong purpose, uh, then you have just very, very bloated systems that don't make sense anymore. And where probably the usage of a tool that was supposed to make your life easier uh, doesn't fulfill that purpose anymore because uh, it, it, it's a lot of noise uh, happening just to create like um, a, a system that, that is supposed to be, uh, well, simpler than that. And well, there, there is also like one, 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 one thing that I would really like to specify. Uh, Kubernetes, for example, is an orchestrator. Uh, whilst a lot of people use it nowadays for uh, their, their complete, their entire fault tolerance strategy. And like fault tolerance is just like um, both a side effect and a tool that Kubernetes uses for 
to, to work the way it, it has to work, but it shouldn't be the focus um, for, and in comparison to the beam, for example. Um, so yeah, yeah, going back to, to this model that I think is the backbone of, of this talk. Um, well, yeah, on the application layer, uh, Francesco can tell you more about this. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, you know, when, when trying to figure out, you know, um, I, I, when I was writing uh, Designing for Scalability, I was really frustrated that there were no applications which would give you kind of distributed frameworks out of the box in, in the whole Erlang ecosystem, both Erlang and Elixir. There were libraries, uh, you know, we had React Core, but there was nothing which was generic and all purpose. And they all went in and solved very, very specific problems. And, and, and that's really, uh, and, and so, you know, trying to figure out why that was the case, um, you know, gluing together different projects I've been working with, uh, I, I kind of came up with this model. And it's, uh, you know, it's, this, this came up, you know, from a lot of different people, a lot of different ideas. I showed it to Chris Mekeljohn um, a few years ago. He says, oh, I've got exactly the same. Only difference is that, uh, you know, I've swapped the programming language and topologies layer, you know, and I, I yeah, went back home, thought about it and said, oh, Chris, yeah, you're right, I'm wrong. And I ended up swapping them too as well. So the, the um, you know, and, and the reason I think, you know, we are where we are is that we are not, you know, creating the layers of abstraction, uh, identifying uh, responsibilities. Um, so as I see it, you know, the very kind of, application layer, we've got the server side, we've got the systems which are highly concurrent event-based applications. And that's where I think most of the coding and the business logic should be placed. It's, it's almost the tip of the iceberg, but at the same time, it's the only thing the developer should see. And you know, think of yourself in the future, you know, what you will be doing is you'll be doing a generic, implementing a generic server with call or cast, and the location though where your callback will be executed is going to become completely opaque. So again, you know, think cloud, think Godfall, you know, think edge computing. And also opaque, you know, and out of the hands of the program will be how your state will be replicated across computers. Um, remember, you know, if you lose, you know, to, to four fault tolerance, you know, you need at least two computers, because a good old Joe Armstrong said, you know, one might be hit by lightning. But if you need two computers, you need to replicate the state across two computers. And guess what? You know, let's not let the programmer worry about this. It's a problem which can be solved in the underlying layers and solved generically. Let the programmer just think that they're coding for a single one, you know, single computer, and then from there, um, yeah, let, let everything you know go over to itself. Yeah, yeah. Cool. so then again, on, on the cloud native ecosystem and the distributed systems ecosystem that outside of the beam, you also see this very similar problem where there is so much tooling uh, that exists around. This doesn't mean that the tooling itself is bad or wrong. They're actually very useful tools. The problem is that uh, it's a lot of noise again. Uh, and also there is not a distinction between the subset of tooling APIs or the tooling uh, resources required by different audiences. With this, I mean that, um, for example, in, in, in this uh, diagram, if we um, focus strictly on the, the layers, uh, we can make that parallel uh, association with uh, how programmers work. Let's say there are some web developers, some mobile developers, and they would be, let's say, in the application level. But there are many tools that are, are focused um, for infra engineers or SREs or the application developers themselves. Uh, actually, if you if if you wished to to get certified in Kubernetes nowadays, there are two different types of certifications, even though they're very similar at its core. Uh, one is for administrators and one is for application developers because uh, the tooling is like pretty different for for every audience yet we are not uh, at a time where and, and community wise where this distinction is very clear so therefore all of these things uh, happening at the same time um, don't make it uh, a, a good environment to to really 
build what you're trying to build in the most efficient way. Um, so I, I agree with Francesco 100% that uh, the problem is not the tooling uh, outside. And sometimes I even get misunderstood with this, like when I specifically mention, like not, please don't use this specific tool if you don't need it or you don't need this other tool and people are like, oh, you don't understand why I need it. No, probably, probably I do or probably I don't. But my point is not that. My point is that you shouldn't be worrying about that and that uh, that should happen like sort of behind the scenes. Yeah. So you know, if we look at all of these applications we've been talking about, you know, web, messaging, mobile, you know, server side in general, uh, they, they are in all in some shape or form based on a, a limited number of programming models. It could be lambdas, it could be you know, event-driven programming, reactive, pub, sub, or, or, or even actor-based. And the way you should be thinking is about extending OTP, uh, you know, but taking into consideration the distribution aspects and doing so hiding all of the challenges of distributed programming from the developer. So just like you know, OTP today will go in and hide all of the challenges around concurrent programming. So race conditions, deadlocks, um, supervision hierarchies, uh, you know, fault tolerance, and everything which I think is, 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 is difficult. Um, what a distributed OTP would allow you to do is you know, to scale your system. You know, OTP today allows you to scale your system vertically. And, what the distributed OTP would allow you to do is you know, to scale your system horizontally whilst providing you know, no single points of failure. And you know, I think you know, this idea you know, went in and started a long, long time ago. Um, I was visiting a company and they were very proudly demoing their Docker Compose system, which allowed you know, what they put in place to dynamically scale up and scale down uh, by the way, they were using Docker Compose at a time when no one should have been using Docker Compose, but yeah. Um, and, you know, it, it, was, it was really, really, really impressive. Uh, you know, the, that dynamic scalability and you know, just the way I'd love to, to, to solve the problem, but, you know, of scale. But, you know, I asked them about their monitor, monitoring, and they proudly showed me an app with beautiful, colorful uh, graphs, which, you know, looked stable at around a number 50. And, uh, you know, and that made me feel, oh, okay, right, 50 transactions per second, you know, it's after lunch, you know, it, it's, it's respectable. And then I spotted the letters TPM. You know, what, what they had was a completely over-engineered infrastructure, you know, to run a virtual machine, which at the time, you know, could handle 2 million TCP IP connections simultaneously, and they were all using it uh, whilst just managing, you know, 50 transactions per minute. You know, that's what TPM stands for. That's what the 50 was for. And, you know, that, that, that really, you know, I think uh, maybe you know, we could call it job security. I don't really know. But, you know, this made me realize that, you know, what you really want to do is abstract not only the programming model uh, from the programmer, but also all of the infrastructure. Uh, you really don't want them to go in and over-engineer something which again should be reproducible, you know, just by plugging something, you know, by plugging in the programming model itself. Yeah, so with this in mind, uh, the hope is that in a few years, no one will be talking about, uh, let's say Kubernetes or a specific tool, and it's a baby tooling around itself. Uh, but instead, we'll, we will be discussing something built on top of that that will hopefully address all these problems that we have been talking about and making more sense out of them and really this time making our lives easier without having to, to worry about um, all, all, all the interconnections. Um, I think that the goal was, or well, it still is, to abstract away the infrastructure uh, instead, we suddenly converted uh, every application developer into an infrastructure engineer, and that is not fair for many reasons that were, deserve a talk on its own. But yeah, going back uh, to, to the main diagram, uh, when we finally 
are able to see that. And I think that we are getting closer and closer. Uh, as, uh, and I can say this from the perspective of, of the people building the tools, not, not as an end user. Uh, so I can confidently say that people on my side are really understanding this and trying to ship that development into that direction. Uh, so once we all have this, um, this vision at the same time, it will result uh, in software being really cloud native, really vendor independent, because uh, again, an another example of this is like uh, a lot of people like to think that Kubernetes and its tools are um, language agnostic, but, and yes, but at the same time, no, because since you, since you have to go very deep and granular for, to, to tweak very specific things, once you go to those levels, um, you have to work either with Go, with Bash, with YAML, like with very specific tools that it doesn't matter that in your application in layer seven that your, your vision was agnostic. You still have to, to have some level of specification. So uh, this time, well, in, in, in the future, uh, we hope that it can really be vendor independent and clearly defined layers which can be swapped. Uh, the reason why we're here today is that we do not have these clear boundaries right now. Um, different layers are bound together, giving you solutions which solve a particular problem, but not easily adopted for the reasons uh, we have mentioned. Uh, well, and then, and this is my opinion. Uh, I think that Kubernetes was released a little bit ahead of its time and not in terms of innovation. Uh, not, not, not the same thing that Francesco was saying, like that it was too modern to be some, like a tool is too modern to be understood really. Here, I think it was the opposite. Like it got uh, adopted super, super early and people started using it in production uh, environments when it was still a, when it was still very hard to, to use, to install, like there were, uh, initial companies uh, that got revenue out of Kubernetes only at the beginning, only for the sheer fact that they went to your office to install Kubernetes because it was very hard to do. Uh, and, and, and I mean, that's curious and it's amazing, but that was the state of affairs uh, at that point in time. So uh, I, I feel, again, speaking from the perspective of the people who create these tools, uh, there, the it, it's still a, a work in progress. Uh, and fortunately, it's reliable. So this is a double-edged sword, because on one hand, if you know how to use it, if you finally know how to tweak it, uh, it will work. In even though uh, there are some features that are that are still a work in progress, um, but at the same time, since it is so complicated to to nail, uh, then your Kubernetes um, or cloud native. Uh, uh, installation will be a little bit flaky, um, to say the least, right? And uh, again, uh, all, all of, I, I don't know how many people in the audience right now have seen this happening, like uh, when, you, when you get called to, to help someone or a company to fix their Kubernetes, their Kubernetes installation, it's always less than ideal, right? It's like, I, I like to say that it's a snapshot of what I, I a, the mind of the main architect uh, has like, you know, like a direct mapping of, of, of someone's mind uh, printed in, into their Kubernetes installation uh, because everyone does what they, what they understand and we cannot blame them. Um, there are so many external tools to choose from that only cause more noise and decision fatigue at its best and very bloated and unnecessarily complex system at its worst. Uh, so Kubernetes is not a fix for leaky software and developers, as I said, end up using these tools as their only fault tolerance strategy, as they're only rolling up this strategy. And these decisions shouldn't be made by the developers themselves. Like, uh, well, I, I hope to, that, that, that we can get uh, to the point where, where all of these concepts can get grasped and um, as, as I said, as developers uh, on, on the tooling side, we're slowly getting there. We're slowly understanding this because, of course, when we develop a tool that we think that will 
finally be the one that will uh, change everyone's lives and that will make their lives easier. Of course, we receive feedback and the feedback is still consistent and like, yeah, yeah, this looks shiny, but it's still very painful to use. And we're like, okay, but why? Because even if the code is shiny, even if it has a long test suite and, and very comprehensive uh, tooling, uh, in the end, the philosophy is the same, that we're not making sure that, uh, that these things are kept behind the scenes. We're, we're still like focusing, or we were still focusing a lot on how, how shiny those tools were instead of the user experience itself um, and how easy this has to be uh, to use for, for the end users. Um, and well, so yeah. <laughs> So yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, uh, I, mean, I couldn't agree more. I mean, you know, the future is has Kubernetes, but I think the developer won't actually realize that it's there. I think uh, they, they don't know, they won't know that they're actually using it. Well, again, it doesn't have to be Kubernetes, it could be some different orchestrator, simpler orchestrator, but they won't know that it's there. And uh, by not knowing that it's actually being used, they, 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 they can't complain that it's uh, <laughs> yeah. hard, yeah, and unfriendly. So, um, you know, if we look at the future, you know, I just love this quote from Alan Kay. And, you know, the future will be distributed, you know, be it cloud, edge, or fault computing, or even on multi-core architectures. But, uh, the distribution should be abstracted and just like OTP abstract concurrency to handle your vertical scalability and resilience, it should become distributed to, to, to handle horizontal scales and no single points of failure. And I think, you know, for everyone, you know, listening today, I think your take home lesson is to ensure that you actually do not come up with something which takes us back a step when moving forward. And what you need to think about is the layers, you know, Veronica and I have gone through uh, today. And when implementing your software, divide it accordingly uh, in, in these layers uh, when architecting it. Release these layers as open source, uh, because you know, by releasing them as open source, A, you'll allow others to use it, and you'll allow others to use it in a way which doesn't make it platform specific and application specific. Um, but it will also you know, help drive the whole ecosystem forward. Um, and you know, it's to your advantage uh, as also you know, of using these layers as your use cases will be changing as your product evolves. Um, you, know, you always want to start with a simple architecture and then start adding the complexity layer. And if you don't have the proper abstractions in place, uh, you're going to have problems uh, evolving and you know, you'll end up with a monolith and you'll end up having to do a complete rewrite. Um, so yeah, so I mean that, that's my message, you know, uh, you know, think distributed but also think user-friendly and try to abstract the complexity as much as possible, you know, focusing on the business logic. Yeah, so for me my final notes would be uh, try to abstract the, the, the complexity, but also uh, the, the, the architecture and what are you trying to, to achieve? Like try not to go with the trends. And that, that, that is always my message on, on, on this. And like try to adopt only what works for you because every installation at this point will be different. So what works for your neighbor or your competitor won't necessarily work for you so try to keep it as simple as possible because it at, at this point in time it will still be painful even if you use two tools or ten tools <laughs> so uh, keep it as simple as possible and just try to grow uh, with the flow um, and yeah focus your experience uh, on your use case on the layer that you need it that you need to solve it at and don't 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 mess with the other layers if you don't need to um and try to be as granular as possible like a, a, from the fundamentals to to the top level if you don't need a tool that is robust enough uh for for a layer seven then don't use it it doesn't make sense because it will just be more painful um but always keeping the abstraction in mind that that would be my takeaway from this yeah. So, Miha, I don't think we've got time for questions. Is that right? Thank you. This was an awesome presentation. Thank you so much.